screen. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on risks and opportunities, transition, and the future landscape of global health funding with L Laura Kerr. It's my pleasure to first give you talk a little bit about some housekeeping, and then we'll introduce ourselves as well. Um, so the webinar should be about 45 minutes in length, but we have booked a whole hour uh, just in case. It is being recorded uh, as because many people were unfortunately unable to join us today. So we will be sharing the recording with them and also with yourself as well as the slides. Um, just remember to be on mute um, when you're not talking so that everyone has the best experience possible. I am hearing some typing, uh, so I'm going to be checking to make sure that uh, people are muted. There is a chat box as well, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can um, always use the chat box. We will be monitoring it. Um, and then towards the end, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussions. So um, it'll be an opportunity then to ask any questions you have uh, for Laura, for Christiana, and perhaps for myself. Um, you do have the opportunity to raise your hand on uh, the computer if, um, if you wish to do so. Um, so I am, I don't know if you all can see me, but I'm uh, Melissa Dubé. I'm the public engagement organizer here at Resolve Canada. I joined the team about four months ago now. And I am with my colleague, Christiana. Hi. I don't know if you can see me because <laughs> yes. my computers aren't synced up, but uh, I'm Christiana Bruno. I'm Child Health Officer uh, with Results Canada. So I, I kind of oversee the vaccine, polio, nutrition, and some early childhood development. Um, with my files. Thank you, Christiana. And I forgot to mention as well that this webinar is in English, uh, but if you have any questions or if you need any clarification, uh, please by all means um, take note and then we'll be happy to um, address them towards the end of the webinar or perhaps after the webinar, depending on how uh, time, um, how we're doing on time. Great, so just a little bit before we start, just a little bit about results uh, in case people are unfamiliar with uh, who we are. So we are a national grassroots advocacy organization and we have been doing great work for actually more than 30 years now and we're unique at what we do and how we do it. So we work closely with national and international partners on global issues and we're a passionate group of volunteers and staff uh, based in Ottawa and our grassroots are all across the country working together as advocates. So we aim at having an impact on the world through different actions, such as writing media pieces, meeting with federal members of parliament or MPs, or having, as an example, events on Parliament Hill. Um, actually, I want to just highlight the photo on your right here is from our Toronto, um, your right or perhaps your left, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so there's a, a collage of photos that you will see from our Toronto group. Um, they already met and uh, did some work on World Immunization Week. So those are the photos that they uh, shared already. So that's pretty exciting. Um, just a bit more as well on results. So uh, what we do really is we combine the voices of our grassroots advocates, so very engaged and passionate citizens, with strategic advocacy efforts to leverage millions of dollars for programs and, Im and improve policies so that access to health and education is ensured as well as opportunities to thrive for all. We work on education, vaccines and immunization, nutrition, among other um, topics. So now I'm happy to pass it over to my colleague, Christiana, who will introduce our guest speaker, Laura, and today's webinar topic. Over to you. Hi. <laughs> um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Laura Kerr. Uh, she's a colleague of ours at Results UK. She's a senior policy officer there. Uh, she leads on the delivery of the organization's vaccine portfolio. Uh, she has a postgraduate degree in international law and experience throughout the sector. She is responsible for Results UK's research and policy analysis and advocacy around bi and multilateral child health programs, with a particular focus on DFID, GAVI, the Vaccine Alliance. She recently joined the GAVI CSO Steering Committee, where, on behalf of over 4,000 civil society organizations, she advocates to ensure civil society are recognized as a key partner in achieving global immunization goals, 
as well as the policy changes needed to increase global immunization coverage and address inequities. With so many fundamental building blocks of health systems affected, Laura and her team have recently turned their attention to the wind down of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which we'll speak to today, seeking to ensure that the global health gains made in the last two decades aren't lost as a result of poor transition planning. Their work can be seen in the recent reports, including a balancing act, risk and opportunities as polio and funding disappears, and owning it, turning immunization commitments into action as well as numerous blogs and, art and articles online. So I will, I can briefly go, I don't, I don't really want to take any kind of moments away from Laura. She's, uh, I know she's got lots of content to go over, so I'll pass it on to Laura now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for that really kind introduction, uh, Christiana. It's, um, very strange for me actually to be this side of the expert speaker because I started off as a results volunteer uh, back in Glasgow in Scotland about seven years ago. Um, so it's actually really exciting to join you all today as the, as the experts, um, expert speaker. Um, so I'm just going to kind of jump um, right in um, to what I think is one of the most important topics that we're dealing with in global health um, today. Um, so I'm going on the fact that you have a little bit of knowledge, maybe done some campaigning previously on some of the big organizations like Gavi and the Global Fund. Um, but do kind of raise your hand uh, kind of through Melissa and Christiana and I look forward to questions um, at the end. Um, so just jumping straight into the, the next slide, if that's okay. Um, I thought I would start with a very quick kind of situational analysis about where we are in the world in 2018. Um, so some of you, I'm sure if you've been campaigning for a while, I've heard of the Sustainable Development Goals or the Global Goals, which are goals that are agreed to by all countries um, around the world um, to really get to where we want to be by 2030. And one of the big things that we are kind of concerned about and we champion here at um, Results, and I'm sure at Results Canada too, is about universal health coverage. And that's about ensuring that everybody has access to the health services they need without a financial burden um, at all times. So that's where we're getting to, but all the different elements of health that we work in contribute to that. Um, so just to say global health, you know, it's a big pot of money. You can see on the screen there it's 19.2 billion. Um, and why this is so important is we're seeing a much, there's, there's a lot of competing priorities out there, a lot of humanitarian emergencies. There's a lot more sustainable development goals than there were millennium development goals. Um, so it's a real, real challenge. We're going to have to really kind of fight to keep a focus on global health, which is, which is what we want. And within this context with money flatlining, um, the, the majority of the world's poorest people now don't live in the, the kind of the poorest countries, as you would expect. Um, this has changed so that 76% of people now live in middle income countries. Um, but the, those middle income countries only account for 20% of health spending. So this means that there's disproportionately amount of money spent on people in poverty who are facing kind of the, the health challenges, whether it be lack of access to immunization, undernutrition, not being able to access TB, drugs and medicines that they need. Um, they're living in middle income countries, but the whole purpose of this webinar is to talk about how finance is changing um, for, uh, for people living in those countries. Um, so just to give one example of that and on to the next slide. Um, one example is Nigeria. Nigeria is a new middle income country. It's no longer counted as one of the poorest in the world, but unfortunately it still has the highest number of unimmunized children in the world. Um, and its health indicators, um, even though it's supposed to have more money as a middle income country, um, unfortunately are, it's performing even worse than some low income countries. So you can see two graphs just on the screen there. Um, the mortality rate, they have 108. Um, can a children die under five um, out of a thousand, whereas a low income rate, that's 76 the average. And you can see from the, the immunization rates I've got in the bottom box, um, that actually says routine immunization coverage is um, 49% in Nigeria, compared to an average in low income countries of 79%. Uh, but since we developed that, that slide, that's from our report, um, we actually found an immunization rate with 33% uh, nationally in Nigeria. Um, and that's as low as two in some of the really fragile, the most fragile states. 
Um, but it's also a country that is seeing donor with a uh, donor reducing the amount of financing that they are putting in. Um, and for us, this is the biggest issue with transition. If we still see countries who are underperforming, who have health outcomes as, as bad as Nigeria, um, that means that as financing changes, we're putting at even bigger risk the people that are already missing out on health services. Um, so going on to the next one, um, the next slide, sorry. Um, I just wanted to highlight the results UK definition of transition. And what's What's really difficult is there's lots of different uh, ways in which people talk about it. They can talk about a change in relationship, changing donor financing, donor withdrawal, or changing aid relationships, among a whole host of other things. Um, but what we believe it to be, um, and how we kind of develop our advocacy off the back, is when gross national income changes, um, and that's our, our growth, and um, that's like, for example, when a country changes from being a low income country to a middle income country. Um, donor financing may stop, it may decline, or the nature of support may change. And for us, it's this process that's transition. It's not a specific point, um, and it's beyond financing, as you can see on the screen there. But it's about what, what changes and what impact that is going to have on the delivery um, of health services. And just to give you a few examples of countries who have recently transitioned, um, we've seen like Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Moldova, Honduras, and even more recently, um, and I should say these are examples from Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Angola, Congo, and Timor Leste. And I should highlight Angola and Congo both have um, immunization rates which are falling, unfortunately, for our countries that have transitioned. Um, so that kind of leads me on to the next slide, which is about the risk, like what happens when countries transition. And I've highlighted kind of before, it's about the people who are already struggling to access health services, the ones who are already missing out, or the ones that won't access health services when donors aren't exist because countries won't provide the services that were once provided by donors. Um, so the three biggest risks I've pulled out just to highlight, and I should say there are a lot more, but um, we could sit and talk about this for hours, um, is the fact that countries look to access to the funding. Um, and this can have a direct impact on the services which they can, um, they are providing. Um, what requires is that changes. We hope countries are in a position where they can kind of fund things that were previously for donor funded and um, to make sure services don't change. But ultimately, we know it's not as simple as that. There's also the fact that donors no longer provide technical assistance. So countries, it's not just about the financing for immunization or the delivery of health services or the amount of drugs. It's also about you know, having people who can work in the Ministry of Health um, or people who are looking at health budget financing and a lot of sometimes technical, technical expertise that we are lucky enough to have in the UK and Canada that, can be, um, that we can work alongside countries to build that kind of capacity. But sometimes transition can happen when the capacity isn't there, unfortunately. And there's also a big thing around civil society exclusion. So a lot of donors um, have mechanisms put in place that make sure that they are involving civil society organizations or uh, non-governmental organizations, NGO, apologies for all the acronyms, um, are involved in uh, decision-making processes. They want the community view kind of taken on board. And it's used sometimes in some countries that are not as favorable to civil society organizations like as in the UK and Canada, um, when donors aren't there to invite CSOs into the room, they're not invited. So then it's a real problem that decisions can be being made without there being any sort of kind of community accountability. And from the people who are working on the ground and see the, the challenges, the risks, the lack of, the, the actually what's happening at a community level when donors leave, um, aren't being included in any sort of kind of policy making or decision making processes going forward. Um, so they're the three big things, and ultimately it comes back to what that impact has on people. What are the services that are no longer continuing? Um, but to put that in context, it's not also just about filling a gap that's been left by donors. There's a triple burden that countries face from a financing perspective. They see reduced support, so they have to find more money from their own domestic resources, from their own health budgets, um, to cover what donors had previously. But there's also the fact that costs increase. When you change from a low-income country to a middle-income country or you transition away from support from one of the bilateral or multilateral donors, you can no longer sometimes access some of the 
um, kind of pooled procurement mechanisms or special rates for certain vaccines or drugs anymore, which means you have to find more money overall to your budget to access higher prices. Um, and also, I think it's really important when we think of the example of Nigeria, there's a lot to be done to address services, to address inequalities as well. No country that's transitioning has a 100% perfect immunisation rate or 100% coverage of TB um, kind of treatment or various other elements of the health service. So there's these three things that countries are trying to expand their health budget and the, the delivery of health services all at the one time. Um, so just on a, moving on to the next one, specifically about the types of transition I've kind of touched on. Um, and apologies, I've put my Department for International Development sign and not uh, the Canadian one. Um, but there's, there's three types we're looking at. We're looking at bilateral, which is Canada's development assistance, the UK aid budget, what the USAID do. Um, and then we have multilaterals. So some of them you might be familiar with. There's Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the Global Fund to Fight HTP and Malaria, and the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Um, and we also have simultaneous transition, and that is when at least two of these organisations are withdrawing or transitioning at the same time. Um, yeah, and from a simultaneous nature, that's something I'll come on to talk about a little bit later. Um, from res results point of view, we've done a lot of work through our Action Global Partnership to really highlight this is something that's kind of happening, is happening now, and there's increased pressures when multiple funds um, are transitioning from the one country at the same time because it's all having it's all increases in the one health budget but sometimes that isn't being considered um, the biggest worry for us around all these different types of transition is each of the funds whether they're bilateral or multilateral have different policies different eligibility criteria of when countries can apply for support and when they can't or when they lose the ability to apply um, they all have different time processes and that kind of brings me on to the next the next slide. So the main transition pro, um, challenges, which we're seeing. Um, so touched on them a little bit there. You've got the timing. So if transition happens very quickly and automatically when a country might be, seem like it's richer because its GNI goes up, this can lead to an almost a kind of a cliff after a short number of years where countries can no longer access financing. This is a worry for us because it sometimes doesn't leave countries enough time to be able to put in place what they have to um, to make sure that they can sustain services. And for us, again, it comes back to the people who are not going to be able to access the health services that they need. And they're often the most vulnerable and the hardest to reach areas already and not receiving the services that they deserve. Um, we we'll also look at the processes. As I highlighted, lots of different processes, lots of different procedures. Um, as policy, I'm supposed to be a policy expert like Christiana from Results Canada and even for us trying to keep track of what is required for each of the different processes and funds and we're not involved in the, the if you were a country facing multiple withdrawals at once trying to work out what's going on and there's real problems with transparency there with countries, um, sorry, donors not really telling countries in a very clear fashion when they are transitioning, um, which makes it really difficult to plan. Um, then on to kind of the uncoordination, so different donors, different processes, they're all making up their own policies based on their own analysis, and there's a real lack of kind of working between the different global funds, bilateral and multilateral donors, to make sure that the, their policy and how that affects a health system or financing for health doesn't affect negatively another transition process that's going on. Um, so one of the big things we're calling on is to, to address that. Um, and also this lack of evidence. Um, transition is new, it's never happened before um, from a lot of the big agencies. So we're still learning. Um, so there's a real learning agenda. Um, and we're just seeing some of the first countries having their, they're kind of, they're kind of transitioning now and we need to do a full analysis of how that process has went and what's happened. Um, so we're still gathering a lot of that, um, which makes our job nice and fun as policy officers who are trying to advise on what we should do next. Um, but just to kind of put this in real terms and moving on to the next slide, um, before I stop being so pessimistic and turn to some opportunities, um, is just to give one case study. So that's the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Um, transition is happening now for the GPAI. 
Um, and for those of you who don't know, this is a global partnership of 30 years um, that has really been set up to eradicate polio. And we are closer than ever. We've ever been with the lowest number of cases last year um, and into this year. Um, and when we achieve eradication, the GPEI will have fulfilled its mandate, um, so will no longer exist. So we're already seeing, with these decreasing polio um, cases, a decline in funding of the organisation um, of 50% between 2017 and 2019. And we know that... Oh, a little bit of noise from somewhere. Um, we know that... There are, oh. Sorry. Um, we know that there are 16 countries where uh, most of this money has been spent and in 13 of them funding will completely end in 2019. Um, so our concern is there the impact that spending on polio has had well beyond just polio vaccination campaigns. Um, and some of those uh, kind of key facts are there. That 70% of global funding for surveillance for all vaccine preventable diseases um, are funded through polio. It's 20% of the WHO's total programme budget. And in some countries, uh, at least four of them, 50% of the WHO in that country are funded through the polio, uh, polio money. And that's, that's going away, that's changing. It's one of the, the first of the biggest kind of health transitions and we've never seen a partnership on this size uh, wind down. Um, so for us, if it's mismanaged, the potential is huge because you've got health workers who are delivering immunizations who are not gonna be there on the ground. Um, so that's, that's just a few kind of worrying um, statistics. And as I said, it's focused on what does this mean at the country level for immunization, um, especially in countries like Nigeria or like South Sudan who have fragile health systems who aren't going to be able to automatically take over the functions that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative um, has been covering. Um, so just kind of moving on to something kind of more positive, um, that hope gives you a bit of an explanation of where we've been in the situation we're in. Um, but we have certainly been doing a lot of work at Results UK on looking at, well, what does transition best practices look like? How do we make sure that the concerns and the worries we have around the risks and the challenges we see, how do we overcome them? And we look at that from three different perspectives. And that's deciding when, the process, and about communication. So in deciding when, we think it definitely has to be, we have to be making decisions that are not just based on GNI and whether a country is low income or middle income. It should be based on the capacity of countries to take over programmes, their existing health inequities, um, the political will to take on programmes when donors aren't there, the disease burden, the coverage and equity of services. Um, and it has to be grounded on the fact that we can't just remain the norm. It's about tackling kind of beyond those baseline figures to make sure that we're reaching the kind of the, the coverage of um, essential services that we want to see. Um, in terms of the process, it's about um, knowing as early as possible when transition is going to happen, um, defining country-owned transition plans that have funding um, plans attached to them, um, and for donors to really be kind of communicating and supporting countries throughout that whole process. Um, the technical capacity in countries is absolutely vital for this. And about communication, that's about communication that transition is happening or will happen kind of as early as possible um, in the most transparent way and that there should be a kind of a realistic time frame given to countries um, to make sure that they can implement the transition plans they need um, and do it in a sustainable way. So like onto just the final slide I'm going to focus on, um, kind of why transition, no matter how much we talk about challenges and um, challenges and risks, sorry, is an opportunity that we shouldn't miss. Um, and for us, that's about, this is an opportunity to look at how we've been, how donor aid has been spent on health systems um, and what we need to do to address the health inequities that we still see in the world. Um, so why now, just to give three examples, it makes political sense. We see more and more donors um, are focused on the sustainability um, of their programmes. And it's about if countries can put money in themselves, um, talking from a very UK perspective, and what we're hearing from our decision makers, that they don't want to give aid anymore to countries who should be putting in their own money. And we don't need to get into a full conversation about that just now. But ultimately, there's a careful balance between the need for domestic resource mobilisation and continuing donor support. Um, 
but there's an appetite there as we look at how do we achieve the sustainable development goals, how do the big multilaterals who were set up years ago adapt to the sustainable development agenda that we're in, um, and how do we make sure that the money is being, um, being spent in the most effective way. Um, so those conversations are now, which gives us great scopeful inference. Um, it's an opportunity to change the way we approach things, which again, just to talk from an immunisation perspective, although this definitely applies to lots of different health interventions. Immunisation, we've done a great job. We have one of the highest, the best rate of immunisation we've ever had with 86% of children receiving the most basic vaccines. But immunisation rates have stalled for five years. And we need to look at how we do things differently so that we don't just keep missing the same children. Um, so it's about looking at well, we've we've got great lessons from polio eradication, but how do we make sure that conversation just isn't about one disease or one vaccine, but about all vaccines that we can reach children with? Um, and as I, I said, kind of continuously, it's maybe my my pet favourite subject within this. Um, it's about looking at the existing gaps in the system, um, and how we address them to make sure that we are not just maintaining coverage, but tackling the inequities that we still see. Um, and I think um, that is me at the end, hopefully within, um, within time. Um, but yeah, I look forward to your questions and hopefully transition makes me feel excited um, as, as part of my job in the Scottish accent, talking too fast wasn't too difficult for too many people. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm just, uh, Christiana will take this on, but I'm just, uh, I'm unmuting people so that people can ask questions. Great. Cool. Thanks, uh, Laura, so much. Um, yeah, really effective way of, of demonstrating the issues. Um, I'll just uh, field uh, questions now for Laura. Um, as Melissa said, she is unmuting. So just, um, I guess, uh, Either just go ahead or put your hand up, and uh, we'll just uh, kind of select people as um, as they as they uh, show um, desire to ask questions. Is anyone? I'm looking at the chat box. I, I have a, I have a question, Christiana. Sure. Hi, Laura. It's Helen Scott. Um, so. This it's a great presentation. That was really interesting and uh, exactly what I was hoping that I would learn by having my lunch with you. <laughs> I was wondering, what are your thoughts on, um, it, given this information and the risks with transitioning poorly, what are your thoughts on how we should be advocating to donor governments around this conversation? So what, what are you saying, for example, to your own government? Yeah, um, great question. Um, do you want me to take one at a time, Melissa, or take a few? Yeah? Okay. Sure. Um, well, it, it's not been easy to, to, to put it that way, Helen. I think, um, as I said, we've really been looking at how do we fit it into the, own, the political agenda that the government is having here. We have seen, we've been talking about transition with certain um, government departments for kind of over a couple of years now and it's only recently they've admitted that like transition or simultaneous transition from multiple funds even exists and um, they are very much under the impression that countries are going to transition and it's going to be successful so what we've been really kind of trying to show is as much information to say look there are countries for example like Angola and Congo who have transitioned but immunization rates are falling um, is that the right position that we need to be in um, from us, it's about being, we've initially had to start in the UK about raising awareness of the fact that this is an issue before we can even get into all the specific details around what the challenges are and what, what needs to happen. Um, so in the UK, we were lucky there was an independent commission on aid impact kind of study done. Which I'm happy to share a link and I'm sure will be kind of relevant across different donor markets. Um, and it kind of looked at, well, what are the processes? What are the policies that have been in place? Um, so we've really been trying to dig down on, okay, well, why are you making the decisions that you are making? Um, and where is the kind of the policy coherence behind this and your overall age strategy? Um, and what I can say around afterwards is a very short um, four-pager that we prepared for 
engaging with kind of policymakers in the UK that kind of sets out this is what we believe transition to be um, because there isn't any sort of acceptance really because each fund and each donor has its own definition and understanding. Uh, backed up with a kind of case study of Nigeria. Here's a country that's middle income, has vast health inequities, has uh, withdrawn from both Gavi and the GPEI right now. Um, and here's some kind of principles that we think should apply to kind of transition. So we don't think that we're ever going to win an argument that transition as a concept isn't right, but being able to highlight in certain circumstances why transition, if we don't kind of, to be able to provide the evidence, I suppose, from a country perspective. Um, and we have some ones on TV that countries have become re-eligible for global fund grants because Global Fund pulled out and their HIV rates soared or their TB rates soared. Um, so at, we're at the stage where we're still trying to bring governments along with us so that they will acknowledge that transition isn't successful and that they need to review the approach that they're taking. Oh, sorry, it's not a simple answer. <laughs> great, that's the, great, thanks. Um, hi, I have a question. If... Hi, Laura. Yeah. Nice to see you. It was a great presentation. This is Shelley from Results, UK, um, Results Canada. Um, <laughs> I kind of have a similar question around um, implementing partners and encouraging how, in a donor market, can we help to encourage our implementing partners um, or formerly or soon to be not partners anymore as they transition out of funding? How do we help encourage them to take on these roles and bolster their health, bolster their health systems? Yeah, um, I think what's happening at a country level is really interesting. And I think kind of civil society have such an important role to play because they're the ones who are doing great work analysing what the health budget is, how much it needs to increase generally, and um, doing that kind of budget monitoring. Um, they're the ones talking to their... Um, their parliamentarians about what needs to happen or how to prioritise health. Um, so I think there's a lot more we need to do with kind of global, especially civil society partners to make sure that they're aware that transition is happening because in a lot of the countries, unfortunately, we might know that transition is happening, but that's not been fed down into the country level. Um, to take it specifically back to polio, there are some very worrying instances where countries are losing polio money by 2019 and there are country transition plans being developed, but they've been largely by the WHO and not their countries themselves. Um, and there's a lack of awareness within some countries or understanding that financing is going to change. Um, so I think as kind of next kind of crucial steps, we need to be kind of raising awareness of the fact transitions happening and uh, making sure that information is more readily available to our country partners. Um, and then I still think there's a mess, massive conversation to be had around how do we build the capacity for increasing budgets for the delivery of health services um, at that kind of country level, but definitely a very big part for our, um, our global partners to be, to be playing. Great. Thanks so much, Shelley. Um, we actually have a question for Mustafa. Let me just make sure that he's unmuted. Uh, th um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Mustafa Fai. I'm in Group Quebec City. I come from Senegal. And uh, I see in Senegal, they have uh, in, in, uh, an initiative for vaccination, a, a private initiative of, for vaccination. Because in Gavi, uh, don't give money, don't give uh, funding of, of, of government in Senegal. And can you tell me about uh, one initiative Senegalese uh, like uh, uh, AfriVac? Do you know AfriVac? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I see, I see uh, uh, six months ago, AfriVac organized a big, a big funding opportunity with, with football uh, soccer man. Mm -hmm. And it is a very, very nice funding initiative for Senegalese government. Now, can you tell me about the about your experience in Senegalese opportunity for funding opportunity about Senegal? No. 
Thank you very much. And um, I don't know what Afrovac is, so if you could add some context there. Yeah. Um, I, Musafa, that's a great question. I would need to go away and do some more um, kind of specific research to answer too much specifically on Senegal. Um, as far as I'm aware, it, I haven't come across it in some of my transition conversations. But I definitely think there is, um, I know that their immunisation coverage could definitely be better. Um, I think the, the, the football cup you were talking to is actually from someone we kind of work with called Speak Up Africa, have been doing loads of work in a general um, awareness raising um, to make sure that even though that it might not be transitioning now, it's on the agenda that there still needs to be increases in kind of health budgets for critical things like immunisation. And that's a really important part of the puzzle that if we can make sure the stories are coming out about transition now, when it's a new thing, we can make sure that learning is shared with countries who will transition at a later date. Um, and the AFRIVAC, uh, if I'm correct, and do, do let me know if I'm not right, Mustafa, um, is a specific, oh no, the, is it the AFRIVAC back thing you're talking about, Mustafa, the meningitis one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's late in the day here. I was just a bit cautious that I, my Meg was playing tricks on me. Um, it's basically an initiative. Uh, it was funded through Gates and through research partners in Africa to develop um, specific meningitis vaccines across for across the meningitis belt, but which don't need um, the same um, cold chain as we have seen before. So it's a specific type of vaccine for that region um, to make sure hopefully that is then more accessible um, to the wider population and um, which were typically harder to reach through the um, existing cold chain systems that we have to have with vaccines. Um, I can send you some more information across. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I can't talk more about Senegal, Mustafa. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Laura, maybe what we'll do is um, once you have uh, more of that information, if you can send it to us and then we'll send it to everyone who's uh, in the webinar and listening to the recording. Is that working yes. with you? Yes, sounds okay. good. Um, Great. Does, yeah. anyone, does anyone else have any questions? <coughs> I don't... Yes, hello. Can. This is Jean-Francois. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Yeah. I have... Uh, Actually, I have several. I, I have three questions. So, okay. And, and uh, you've had the friendly questions. I'm going to have now uh, give you the tough questions. How's that? Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll start with the medium tough one, but uh, but this is the real one. So, advocates like us have argued for many years that our government should be investing in polio eradication because it would actually free up funding. It would be a smart investment because look at all the savings you'd make once we actually get closer to eradicating polio. And now we're a little bit speaking from the other side of our mouth saying, well, no, 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 wait a minute, don't withdraw that funding here. So what do you say to that argumentation? I say it a bit facetiously, but you realize, of course, that this is a real life argument that people yeah. will, will bring up. Uh, the second, uh, question is actually about uh, more generally uh, what do you say to the general objection that listen this is a finite pot of money are you really telling us to take away money from dollar a day folks to give it to f people who are actually resource rich who are low medium income, not extremely poor countries. Is that really what you want us to do? And we need to be able to face that tough question because that is not a, a question that we'll be able to avoid, of course, right? Yep. The, the third question is uh, the question of materiality. A lot of the countries that are currently graduating at, at this very moment, say from the World Bank, are actually not countries that I would send a single red cent to because they're doing quite fine. I'm talking about Vietnam, I'm talking about Sri Lanka, just to name two, 
And I think Bolivia is perhaps a little bit less uh, in, um, in an exemplary situation. But the public health system of Vietnam is very good. It's actually sustained very well assaults against TB. Uh, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka, again, a very good public health government. Yep. We don't want them to be eligible to any funding that would otherwise go to DRC, that would go to more generally West Africa, et cetera. Anyway, so these are my three tough questions. Okay, just to finish on a high note. Um, okay, no, I really appreciate them. And I think they're very, very important questions to be asked. Um, and they don't have easy answers, unfortunately. Um, I'll go through them one by one. Yes, we've argued for polio eradication. And yet, yeah, initially, you hope that when we no longer have to vaccinate, we don't have to put that kind of money in. Um, I think it's just the, the way things have been set up that's not, it's not as possible. I think what we need to see happen in the next five years is that we're not just funding polio, that we are putting money through different mechanisms with different priorities that are looking at ways in which we really strengthen routine immunization systems because ultimately we need the routine immunization system to deliver the continuous vaccination we're going to need for polio even after polio is eradicated. Um, so yeah, the argument that we, we free up money isn't one that I've used kind of too much. Um, because ultimately when you get, it's never just an end point that you get rid of one thing and we move on to another. And if anything, I would argue that even when we look at polio funding, we shouldn't just jump on to like, let's look at measles or let's look at something specific. What we really need are systems, good primary healthcare systems, which can be delivering multiple different health interventions. And that's far more cost effective. So that will save us money in the long run. So that's about the different donors, both bilateral and multilateral, working together to understand where we're all reaching the same child. Whether it be with a malaria net, to check for undernutrition, to check if you're immunized, um, how do we actually make sure that all these pieces of the puzzle are coming together? And that's what we need to focus on. Um, so that's a bit of a round way, but way of asking, answering your polio question. Um, that is just kind of not as simple as one pot into another. Um, generally about there is a finite pot of money and I think we really need to acknowledge that. Um, I don't think anyone is suggesting that we take money from low income countries to spend on um, kind of lower middle income countries, that differentiation and this kind of comes on to that, the, the, the next part. It's about developing the funding systems which we need to reach the people who are not being reached by any other way. It's about people and like the, the child who's unvaccinated, no matter kind of what kid they live in, what country they live in for me. Um, so I yeah, don't think we're arguing and I think what we're, we're seeing is a shift to more money being spent, especially in fragile countries where the country's health systems can't function. Um, even in, in a transition. Um, so yeah, it's about focusing on where the need is. And as I've said, more of the people who are living in poverty are living in middle income countries at 76%. And there's a huge wide spectrum of middle income countries. But you're looking at countries like Nigeria that's just, that's, that's just tipped over into low middle income status, which has faced, or, or Ghana example, that's that's been progressing, but then you look at the financial instability in that country, it's just not feasible um, for them to kind of transition at this time. But I completely take your point. Sri Lanka is a one that, um, an example we've used in, in some of our reports that is an example of if you have really high political will, you have dedication to creating sustainable financing systems, and you have complete ownership over your programs because you want them to be as efficient and delivering to the best quality for your citizens. Um, they transitioned, and I don't, we're not arguing that the Sri Lanka should have any sort of post kind of transition support. What we're seeing is countries who do not have all of those different elements um, need to be considered. And for us, that's about how are we, how are we making the decisions on which countries get funding? Um, and that's for us, it's about indicators. So we're not saying, oh, well, your middle income but you should still get money, not at all. We're saying we need a comprehensive set of indicators which look at the capacity of a country, uh, its, the, its future financing abilities, 
um, what partners have already been included, what the capacity is of their Minister of, Ministry of Health. So looking at all these different elements uh, before a decision is made to transition and all of that should come down to you know, what is the health service are, um, like at the moment um, and what is going to happen when transition happens and we need greater analysis of that. As I said, it's a new subject and I'm certainly not a data analysis uh, where policy advocacy is about taking the evidence and taking them to decision makers to make them think differently. And for us, when we're seeing countries, as I said, becoming re-eligible for funding because they're um, the people with HIV suffering or their TB rates have went up so high in a vast number of years that it becomes like an international emergency, or we're seeing countries like maybe Nigeria is not the best one, but other ones who have immunization rates of only 70% of the most basic vaccines. But you know that like a far, far higher number of children are not fully immunized against all 11, with all 11 WHO recommended vaccines. These are the indicators and things we need to be looking at. Um, so definitely not a kind of a low income, middle income split, but let's focus on the people and where the where there's still a need for services, like where are those people that have been left behind? Um, and that comes down to how donors are approaching things. And that's not from uh, a lot of the time they're making political decisions on where we once colonized pretty much, and we need to move away from that. Um, I hope they're not too much of a, um, that they go into enough detail, those answers, uh, but they're, they're hard questions and they're, they're difficult and that's what we have to work through kind of as advocates. But for me, it comes down to the people and that's at the heart of all the arguments that we make. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, JF, I think you uh, wrapped up our question time. Um, maybe we'll take one more if it's super, super quick or if, you, if it's not super quick, we encourage you to email us and we'll pass on the question to uh, Laura, but we have time for just one more. Is there anyone that has anything very quick to uh, respond to? I Anybody? I don't see anything. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'll just reiterate that if you do have uh, questions, um, for sure send them to us and we'd be glad to answer them. And we know it's a, it's quite a complicated issue um, and for many people, um, this is sort of the, the kind of the first time that these issues have been brought up and I think it's a conversation that um, is going to be ongoing. As Laura said, it, it, is, it is quite difficult and JF, you're right to ask, to ask these questions because these are sort of conversations that we need to have on our side about how we talk about transition with the Canadian government and given that we've asked for support for eradication of polio up to this point. Um, how do we how do we talk about uh, transition? How do we get them to address it seriously, but still, you know, maintain uh, the need to continue funding for vaccine coverage and for polio eradication more broad, um, more specifically. So these are really great questions, and and yeah, well, we're going to be ongoing and thinking about it. Um, so just to take a step back, and it, it's. It's unfortunate because I'm sure we're all riled up now about the transition conversation and, and to talk about uh, this month's action sheet a bit, a little bit more Canadian specific. Um, so this action sheet obviously is about immunization uh, this month uh, because of World Immunization Week that started, that's starting tomorrow, officially, the 24th of April to the 30th. Um, and so this sheet basically wants to kind of explore, take a moment to explore sort of what have been the achievements and what are the gaps and um, within the Canadian context, where do we need to go forward? So for instance, we all know that um, routine immunization and vaccine coverage, vaccines generally are one of the most cost effective and crucial uh, health interventions out there. It prevents cerebrates uh, estimated two to three million child deaths every year. Um, however, as Laura says, uh, the vaccine coverage globally is uh, 86%, um, which sounds quite high, but if you consider that uh, when the uh, decade of action of vaccines started in 2011 uh, to 2020, the global rate was at 85%. So actually in the span of time since 2011, the progress, uh, progress has only grown by 1%. 
Um, and if we only have uh, two and some years left, uh, to the end of the decade, that progress is too slow to reach the target of 90% global coverage. Um, also, for instance, uh, WHO estimates that 19.5 children are 19.5 million children are missed every year um, by routine immunization. Uh, only 5% of the global population of children are receiving the 11 recommended WHO vaccines. Um, so there's still some pretty significant gaps. Um, so there's still uh, a need to continue emphasis on closing those gaps. Um, and ensuring no child is left behind. Um, to kind of put it into the broader context to Canada, in 2017, Canada launched its feminist international assistance policy, uh, which centralizes uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, however, uh, routine vaccination and strengthening health systems like uh, routine immunization systems is not highlighted, uh, what well, we feel not highlighted as well as it could be um, in the policy. And so we just wanted to take this moment to remind the Canadian government of the gaps in routine immunization coverage or vaccine coverage generally um, and ensure that they see the linkage um, between, um, uh, sorry, they see the linkage between uh, addressing those gaps and uh, gender um, equality and empowerment. Um, so uh, what you can do is uh, you can contact us. If you have any more questions, you can write a letter to the editor uh, making that linkage. You can also write to Minister Mary Claude B. Bowe, the Development Minister, Mary Monsaf, Minister of uh, Status of Women, and Jeanette Petipat Taylor, who is our Health Minister, um, or be active during this week on social media. Perfect. Thank you, Christiana. Um, so just this slide is a reminder of our email. So if you have any questions, if there's anything that you'd like to address, we can, uh, we're more than happy to liaise with Laura and we will follow up uh, with the recording, the slides and the additional uh, resources uh, that were promised. And of course, I can't, uh, we can't finish this webinar without mentioning our national conference that is coming up in, I guess it's about 10 days now. Um, it's not the week, the upcoming weekend, it's the weekend after. So if you're in Ottawa on the weekend of May 5th, uh, we definitely invite you to uh, attend our national conference that brings together global experts, influencers, and advocates uh, with the goal of educating and inspiring action and advocacy in pursuit of a more uh, just world. So we'll definitely be talking about uh, things like we've discussed uh, today. Um, Stephen Lewis is our conference keynote speaker and he's a Canadian and global leader. And then you'll also have the opportunity to hear from members of parliament and gain skills in this series of advocacy workshops. So if you wanna have, uh, if you wanna continue uh, asking the tough or a bit less tough uh, questions, you're definitely invited to join, uh, to join us at the conference. And last but not least, thank you for being here today, for taking time out of your busy days. And thank you very much, Laura, for um, being here after work hours on an evening. We really <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, and thanks for uh, your insights. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thanks, Laura, again. Such a great presentation. And we hope to continue with this conversation going forward. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for the great questions. Don't don't hesitate to reach out. But um, it's been great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. And a good night. <laughs> Thank you.